Hello, welcome to part seven of the Magdalene Manuscript. I am going to have to divide this section into two, possibly three sections, because it is a very long section. And I know that if videos go over an hour, sometimes that's a little bit too much. But we are going to be starting on the Egyptian alchemy today. As always, if this is your first time signing on to this channel, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. There are obviously six other parts prior to this part. Now, for those who are new, the first section of this book is a channeled message from Mary, the person we know as Mary Magdalene. On this channel, though, we're just going to be calling her Magdalene because Magdalene was actually her name. We are under the impression that Mary was not her name. So this person allegedly channeled Magdalene where she spoke about her childhood growing up in the priestesshood of Isis. They, her and Yahshua ben Joseph, the person we know as Jesus, were actually Egyptian, not Jewish. And so that is very confirming through this channeling that yes, she was not um, her nor Yahshua were actually Hebrew. With that being said, if you've been on this channel with me for a while, some of the channeled stuff in this book, I don't agree with. I think there are some stuff that is confirmation biased. For example, we now know historically that the person known as Yahshua ben Joseph was not crucified. That's a lie. That was so that the Christian church would become a, a satanic church where they wa worship the god Mithra. Um, if you don't know anything about that, I just suggest that you start looking up Mithraism. Um, Yahshua ben Joseph and the Magdalene were twin flames, meaning that they were the same soul, and they both carried the Christ consciousness. Um, they were not neither one of them wanted to be worshipped as gods. That's something that Constantine the Great established at the Council of Nicaea. Yahshua was just a teacher. Magdalene was just a teacher. And as we see in this manuscript and in some other works, it was actually Magdalene who activated Yahshua. They did that through the sex magic of Isis. And I know that's going to ruffle a lot of feathers, especially if you're new to this. Um, because we always think of that as being dark and dirty. And yes, there is a version of that. There's always an inversion. There's always a darkness to the light. So the inversion of that is dealing with things like the succubus and the incubus, um, non-consental relation, intimate relationships, that kind of stuff. But when there is a union of two consenting people, then you can create this type of magic, especially if you're a twin flame especially because you are uh, the same soul that literally divided into two different bodies, a divine feminine and a divine masculine. And so when the act of putting that soul back together happens, allegedly there is a lot more potency um, to that act, if that makes sense. As, as you know, Stephanie, my friend Stephanie, I've been talking about this solar flash that's coming up that we think the solar flashes are actually not external, they're more internal, having to do with the twin flames coming together and actually doing it. Um, so th that's the flash of life, the spark of life that comes into the womb. And so that's the first half of this book. He does get into it. We talked a little bit last week about how to understand the energetic body, or as the Egyptians called it, the Ka body. This goes in more Western terminology, that would be like the gross body versus the subtle body. The gross body is literally just your body, right? The sensations that you feel in your muscles, in your body, you know, when your quadriceps are sore, that kind of stuff, that's the gross body response. But the subtle body is, well, it's, it's more subtle. Yeah. It's, it's being able to feel more detailed inner sensations that aren't necessarily connected to the physical realm of the gross body. And so that's kind of what he spoke about last week. The whole practice of yoga deals with understanding the subtle body versus the gross body. 
However, if you're not a yoga practitioner, I do believe that you can discover this type of sensation through any type of exercise, as well as this very simplistic exercise that he gave last week. So if you if that's something you're interested in and you missed the section last week, I will place that link down in the description box below. So, all right, we're going to start with Egyptian alchemy on in my book. This is page 98 might be different in your book, but Egyptian alchemy. According to the alchemist of ancient Egypt, we possess two bodies. The first is called the cot, is our physical body of flesh and blood. It is the body we normally identify with, the body we eat and drink with, the body that lives and dies. The second body is called the ka and is sometimes referred to as the etheric double or spiritual twin. It is a duplicate of the physical body, but it is made of pure energy, not flesh and blood. This ka body interprets the cot physical body, and there is no part of the cot or physical body that is not enclosed by the ka. Transformation of the ka body is a fundamental process of Egyptian alchemy. But before we discuss how this is done, I think it would be good to take a look at these two bodies, the ka and the cot, from the standpoint of physics. I believe the modern context will give us a foundation to better understand, to better understand the strange world of the ka body and its non ordinary potentials. So yeah, so if you guys have been you've been with me for a while, this absolutely is spoken about in yoga. So the subtle body would be connected to in a part of Purusha. It's not Purusha. Purusha is the Atman. It's the, the thing that travels with you throughout every life. And your property is your body. So this the subtle body, the energetic body is kind of that intermediary in between the, the Purusha and the property. And you've heard me say a lot that in the East, in Eastern uh, theology and Eastern spirit spirituality, the body, the physical formation of the body or the property is actually the Shakti of the Shiva. It's the expression of the soul. And so in the Western world, sometimes we see our body as being separate from our soul. Um, I've said before, I grew up in a medical family. The Bryce's, my mother's maiden name is Bryce. And the Bryce's, it's a long line of doctors, just doctor, 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 doctor. Um, big time medical family. That's like the family business, right? And so even my family, you know, if you, there's a lot of cancer in my family. So oh, we got, we got to look out for that because you could inherit that. Um, we, we didn't understand that a lot of these diseases, these things that happen to the physical body are merely an expression of the soul or the energetic body. And so when we start to get into Eastern theolo theology and Eastern spirituality, we understand that the body, the physical gross body is more of a GPS system. So when something is misaligned in the physical body, it's not necessarily just because you've inherited it. You do have inherited karma, but it's misaligned because something in the energetic body is misaligned. My friend Shanti and I over on Aquarius Rising Africa speak about this all the time. And so when you bump up against a limitation, a sickness, something within the physical body, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just your soul, your energetic body saying, hey, look at this, look at this, look at this. And the power that you have as a spiritual being is to then go and course correct. And usually we course correct the physical by healing the emotional. All right. So he now, now we're going to go into the section of quantum physics. We can describe the cut, the dense physical body quite well in terms of Newtonian physics. It obeys, for instance, the laws of gravity. And to be honest with you guys, I don't even think gravity exists anymore because of my studies of dark area. I don't even know if Newton actually existed at this point, but we're just going to keep going. And you can predict with a good deal of certainty where it will be physically if you know the direction it is heading and the speed at which it is moving. Not so with the caw. The caw body is outside the realms of Newtonian physics, and it is best described using the laws of quantum physics. And what you may ask determines if something is bound by Newtonian laws or by the laws of quantum mechanic, size. You guys have probably heard that term a lot lately. I speak about the quantum. When I speak about the quantum, I'm speaking about the world that exists beyond the veil. It's something that happens the more you learn how to channel, the more you learn how to actually descend into your own being is you can tap into that quantum realm. You can kind of be in both places, be aware of the quantum realm as well as the physical realm. Larger objects larger than one thousandth of an inch obey the laws of Newt Newtonian mechanics. This is because they have enough mass, density, or weight to have gravitational fields. Again, don't know if that's correct. 
the more you learn, the less you know. The more you learn, the less you know. We have, it's funny. I mean, I, I'm highly educated. I've been very, quote unquote, privileged to have a high, high level of education. That was something that was expected of us in my home growing up. I didn't even know didn't even know that university was an option when I was a kid. I thought everyone just had to go to university. But um, I'm actually, when I was in my early 20s, after, and I was living in Los, out in Los Angeles, I was looking at going to UCLA for some continuing education stuff. And I'm so glad I didn't do that at this point because our whole educational system, guys, everything is one big fat lie. All of it. It's all programming and indoctrination. And when people tell me, and it's so mean, but it's true. When people tell me they went to like an Ivy League school, like Princeton or Harvard or Cambridge or something, I'm always like, oh, that's so embarrassing. Bless your heart. That's so embarrassing. Cool. Because you got fed a whole lot of bullshit. So, um, and you're walking around with the big ego because of your, your degree, but your degree is literally worthless because it means nothing. It means you got indoctrinated into the lie, basically. And why would this happen? Why would they lie to us so much? It's because it's because the controllers, the dark players understand consciousness. They understand this idea of a collective group think in that all of us are power, powerful individuals on our own, but we can get the mass collective to believe a certain lie. Then the lie becomes truth. Yeah. And so, as I've said many times now over the last few weeks, what we're dealing with right now is a timeline war, right? So the whole history that we've been taught through our educational system, through our churches, everything is the negative timeline. It's the timeline that didn't happen. It's a timeline that they're trying to create a reality so that we go into the great reset, the new world. And then the word that starts with an O, right? I can't say that word on YouTube. Um, but that's not the truth of what happened. And that's not the truth of who we are. We know that our planet is not what we think it is. We know that we do have a firmament, whether you're a flat earther or a round earther or somewhere in between, we do have a firmament. It's like we're in a snow globe. We've seen politicians actually talk about this firmament. They're not hiding it. And so a lot of this science that we've been taught is not necessarily fact, but more of propaganda. It's more of propaganda to try to get us onto a negative timeline so that we don't understand the, how powerful we are. However, as I said, with the channeling portion of this, before this great awakening, we all believed the lie. We all did. I was somebody that already had had a lot of spiritual experiences, but I consider myself to be a highly intelligent person. I did well in school and I retained a lot of information and I felt like I was pretty well educated in the sense that I knew I knew my stuff. But now the stuff I know, the stuff I learned was nothing but bullshit. And I'm actually questioning things even like gravity, because if we're not just floating out in space, if there is like a world beneath us called Agartha, if we do have a firmament, then does gravity even exist? But I know the truth of Prakriti, Purusha, and Ishvara. I do know that that is grounded in truth, that the body is an expression of the soul and the soul never dies. And so that part of this is very, very true to me. However, some of the science stuff he is speaking about, in my opinion, at this point is nothing but indoctrination, which is fine because we've all been indoctrinated. We, we've all been indoctrinated. And even if we know how to channel, if we have a really set thought of what happened, then that becomes confirmation bias. We start to see it as we've been taught to see it. Okay. So just want to put that out there. All right. However, objects less than one thousandth of an inch follow a different drummer. This is because their density or mass is too small to create a gravitational, gravitational field of any consequences. The Ka body exists within the round, the quantum world. Since the Ka is primarily light energy and has very little mass. So that's what I'm saying. When you start to tap more into your subtle body, you can live in both the quantum, the five the fifth dimension and the third dimension. So again, the body, our ascension we're going through right now, our physical world is going from a third density planet to a fourth density planet. However, our consciousness, our psyche, our energetic body is going from third dimension to fifth dimension. And the law of one even talks about this time period where people will be living in both, both fourth density and third density going back and forth. And I think that's something that I've been experiencing. I think a lot of you have probably been experiencing that as well. All right. The quantum, the quantum world that the Ka body dwells in is very strange indeed. 
So it is the fact that you and I live in both the Newtonium and the quantum universes simultaneously. Our bodies are squarely in the, in the Newtonian world. If we jump off a cliff, for instance, we will fall until we hit the ground, victims of gravity. Unless, of course, we are bungee jumping, in which case an equal and opposite force pulls us back. But if we enter the atomic and subatomic levels of our bodies, we are in a different world altogether. The minuscule particles that compromise our bodies are not bound by the laws of Newtonian physics. They are instead bound by quantum mechanics. The quantum world is very bizarre by our standards. Perhaps one way to describe this is to discuss experiments with light. Now, light can take two very different forms with very different properties. It can, for instance, take the form of particles, photons, or it can take the form of waves. As absurd as this sounds, if a researcher is looking for light in the form of waves, that is how the light will present itself in the experiment. If, however, the researcher is looking for light in the form of particles, that is what he or she will see. This early discovery in quantum physics eventually becomes formalized as Bell's Theronian, which states that at quantum level, there is no objective observer since the intention of the experiment affects the outcome. Exactly. That's what I was just saying. The intention affects the outcome. What you will seek, you will find. Again, that's why they're trying to get us on a negative timeline because the intention affects the outcome. Those who control the past control the future. Those who control the present control the past. So we have to start figuring this out. What we think becomes a reality, especially collectively. So we have to start to reevaluate and we got to start course correcting. Somehow the intention of the researcher mysteriously affects the behavior of the sum at atomical particle. How this happens has not yet been explained by science, but it is generally accepted that Bell's theronium is true. Physicists are reluctant to ascribe to Bell's theronium to phenomena outside the minuscule world of some atomic particles. The reason for this is, of course, because everyday objects like billiard bar balls and rockets are too large to be affected by intention. Attention is known to have an effect at the quantum level, but not so much in the Newtonian world. I beg to differ. I think there are people that can actually move uh, billiard balls, pull, you know, the balls on pool tables. They're heavy. I think there are people that can actually move them. You know, I've seen some crazy shit in India and I've read some crazy, crazy um, autobiographies and biographies of different uh, people experiencing um, gurus who have siddhis. Siddhis are spoken about in the third and fourth pot of the yoga sutras. Um, they're kind of like the yoga powers. I hate to say it that way. Um, heightened sense of, in, of, of intuition, knowing how to control your body mass in the sense that levitation can occur. So I think by saying we absolutely can't move things like billiard balls is, is limiting our own potential as spiritual and conscious beings. You know, we, we have the potential to move mountains. So, um, but what he's saying too, it's like, as somebody I keep saying, when you're channeling into the quantum and you're getting information from the quantum, things have to play out in the quantum first before they can play out, before they have the ripple effect of playing out into the physical world. So um, with this battle that's going on, even though we know the Sphinx has closed its eyes, which means that Lucifer is now turning on his people, we might not see the effect of that until later on. It's happened in the quantum, but it's taking a moment for the ripple effect to come down to the physical world. All right. But there is a weird place where the quantum world and the Newtonian world meet, and it is of all places inside of our minds and our bodies. Tucked away inside our brains are teeny tiny gaps between nerve cells. These spaces between the neurons are called synopsis, and, and the average distance of these gaps, you may have already guessed it, is approximately 1,000 of an inch, the entry point to a strange world of quantum events. A nerve impulse has to travel the length of a neuron and jump across the tiny synaptic gap if it is to get to the next neuron. Nerve impulses are much like relay laces in which they run the length of the neuron and jump a hurdle. What actually jumps the hurdle is a little molecule called a neurotransmitter. At any moment, there are thousands upon thousands of those neurotransmitters jumping hurdles. And each moment is a quantum event since these molecules are approximately less than one thousandth of an inch. This is one reason why our thoughts can be so novel and unpredictable. Some of the neurotransmitters jumping to the sympathetic hurdle make it while others don't. 
Those that make the leap create a response with the next nerve cell. If these hurdles take place in the thinking part of the brain, the neocortex, then we will have an experience of thought. The concept of intention is crucial to both quantum physics and internal alchemy. Indeed, we will find that if it is through the agency of both mental attention and personal will intention, that the alchemist is able to affect specific quantum events within his or her body mind. We will see this very clearly later on. But for the moment, let me just say that internal alchemy, such as the Egyptian system, are primarily methods to alter certain aspects of the quantum universe. The Ka body is itself in the quantum realm and as such is easily affected by the int intentionality of the alchemist. Stephanie and I talk about that all the time, especially with divination. And, and in my opinion, divination is absolutely not spirituality. Um, spirituality is looking on yourself. Divination is just knowing how to communicate with the other side, right? You can be able to channel big time and still be an asshole because you've refused to work on yourself, right? Still live in your ego because you've, refu you've refused, refused to do their true spiritual work. But what, what we are saying here and what we've talked about, you know, if you look at things like tarot cards or dousing or whatever, it's the conduit. It's the person's intention. So tarot cards are just cards. That's all they are, just cards. It's the person channeling, using the cards to translate what the spiritual realm is telling them has good intentions and is asking for consent and is using guides of their highest good and collective highest good, then they're going to get probably a different outcome than people who are working for the dark players. So it's all about intention. It's also about the, about the alchemist, the conduit. There are other oddities in the quantum world. You can't, for instance, predict things. In the Newtonian world, if you throw something, you can predict where it will land, but not so in the quantum. Here, there are only probabilities, possibilities. Objects flying around in the quantum world might land where you expect them to, or they might just spin around in circles or dissolve into light. The possibilities are virtually endless. There are other strangenesses tucked away in the quantum realm. A very bizarre phenomenon develops when two particles meet in the quantum world. Now we get this. After their chance meeting, the two particles spin off into space, each of them going along its merry way. But is, if one of them changes the direction of its spin, the other one instantaneously changes the direction of its spin as well. There is simply no current plausible explanation for this weird behavior. And although we need not concern ourselves with such shenanigans in the Newtonian world, they are part and parcel of the quantum. So you remember my friend Catherine talked about this with the tuning forks. If you have one tuning fork resonating at a really high vibration, it's going to naturally just pull up this tuning fork this can't be explained in the physical world it's because the quantum is moving it right like the two spinning discs he's talking about i already mentioned how our thoughts exist within the weird twilight zone of quantum reality what i mean by this is that the neurological events responsible for thought example the jumping of neurotransmitters across the synthetic gap are clearly in the quantum world. And it is a strange quirk in our neuro neurology that affords us the possibility of affecting quantum events within our own bodies and minds. So what do I mean by this statement? Am I implying that you and I can have an effect on our own physiology through mere mental attention? Yes, I am. And this is one of the reasons internal alchemies are so effective. Our bodies and minds are intimately connected. They are, in a very real way, two sides of the same coin, and research verifying the interconnectedness of the body and mind is flooding scientific journals all over the world. A relatively new field in, in uh, medicine is an area called psychoneurology immunology. It's a big word, but it basically means how our thoughts and emotions affect our phys physiology and specifically our immune system. Yes, that was, that's what I was saying in the beginning. Our, our whole emotional state affects everything. Our, our energetic body affects everything. The physical body, the gross body is not doing anything that the emotional, mental, uh, spiritual body isn't telling it to do. Okay. So that that's correct. And our ancestors knew this. This is not new. It's new for us, but our ancestors did know this. I could quote numerous studies in this regard, but I think a story might serve our purpose more effectively. Although the situation involved pain management and not internal alchemy, some of the principles are the same. Several years ago, a client was referred to me for the treatment of immense physical pain. She was in the advanced stages of cancer and it had metastasized into her spine. She was, in her own words, in constant and unrelenting pain. As Joan, I have changed her name, 
described her situation. I asked her to rate her current level of pain and discomfort, 10 being the worst she had experienced and zero being the least. She self-assured her pain level around eight. I then asked her to, to describe the most relaxing and refreshing experience she had ever had. She went into a long, detailed count of her, her visit to Sedona, Arizona, and how she loved the red lot rocks and canyons of the area. Reaching over a stereo I had in my office, I played some music that was specifically written to lower brainwave activity into the more relaxed states of increased alpha activity. I actually studied the alpha activity with a teacher once with my yoga um, studies. I'm not going to go into details. Um, it was like an advanced understanding class of, of thought. Um, but yes, I am familiar with what he's talking about here. I then asked her to imagine being in Sedona again. I asked her to make it as vividly real as possible, seeing it, hearing the sounds, sensing the physical sensations, perhaps even smelling the aromas. Her face muscles, which had been quite taut, relaxed a bit as she recalled the scene. I then suggested she find a place that she found particularly beautiful and soothing. She chose a large boulder overlooking a canyon, and I then suggested that this boulder had a powerful healing energies, and that with each breath, she was effortlessly drawing these healing energies into her body. After a few minutes of this, Joan opened her eyes suddenly and reached for her purse. Opening, she pulled out a tissue and patted the area around her eyes. What happened? I asked. It's gone, she said. What's gone? I asked. The pain, she said. The pain is gone. The release from pain had been quite emotional, and after giving her a moment to compose herself, I asked her how to rate her level of pain for me. Zero. After several sessions, I showed Joan how to control her own pain through mental attention and intention. She reported that although the cancer was still spreading, she was able to greatly reduce her pain without the need for medication. The neurological events responsible for ending Joan's pain were quite complex and they were birthed, spawned, if you will, from the quantum world. Had someone stumbled into my office, they would have seen a woman with her eyes closed, sitting in a chair listening to some music. But this was the Newtonian realm, the world of objects and people. The quantum realm would have remained unseen, but it was this world that was responsible for the change in Joan's condition. It was in this realm, tucked between the synthetic gaps within her brain, the newer transmitters battled for supremacy. Some of these neurological messengers carried messages of pain. The dying cells in her spine were, after all, sending their constant death cries to her brain. But at the same time, other messages were carrying feelings of peace, relaxation, and comfort. For a moment, the messengers of comfort won out over the messengers of pain and death. And if I may be so poetic, all this took place in the froth and foam of the quantum sea. This ocean, though hidden from our eyes, is the birthplace of everything that exists both inside and outside. The, this ocean, though hidden from our eyes, is the birthplace of everything that exists both inside and outside our minds. It is the mother spring of all creation, and it is this that is ultimately the focus of our internal alchemies, regardless of their method. This means to alter quantum events within the body and mind of an, alchemi of an alchemist is similar in regards to what happened to Joan. The primary difference is that the alchemist is not seeking to alter pain, but rather to alter consciousness itself. It's exactly what Shanti talks about in all her courses. The agency responsible for this monumentous alteration is nothing less than thought joined with awareness. It's what yoga means. Yoga means one-pointed focus, bringing your awareness to a one-pointed focus. Thought and awareness are ephemeral things, as anyone who has tried to hold either for a long period of time knows. It is also in thought that we can experience things we could never do in the real world. By the real world, I mean the Newtonian reality of everyday life. We are used to the force of gravity, for instance. We expect things to fall if we drop them. We do not expect things to float in the air, perhaps in our dreams, but not in reality. What, if, what I would like to pr propose to the reader is the idea that we live in two realities simultaneously. One of these realities we are quite familiar with. It is our everyday world, the world where things fall if you drop them. And so to go a little bit deeper into the yoga perspective of this, the Newtonian world, as he's calling it, again, I don't know, New never even lived at this point, but the physical world, the Prakriti world. In yoga, the yoga sutras, this is called as the world of illusion. So the Prakriti is the illusion. It is the it's the creation of the soul, but it's merely just the illusion, the matrix. And so it's not set in stone because it is something. And us us knowing that we we understand the Newtonian world, that is where we have our Maya, where we have our own delusion because we are believing the illusional world 
over the quantum world where in reality the quantum world is the real world and this world that we're in is just a projection of our soul so therefore it's not even real in that extent if that if that makes sense it gets really psychedelic the more you like the way i see it i tell my students this all the time with this these types of theories these very very old types of theories it's so much easier to understand in theory than to actually go out and try to practice it like the next time you're outside walking in the park or something like try go touch that tree and try to tell yourself this is all a projection of spirits right it's gnarly it's super gnarly because we've been born through this veil of amnesia where we think that's where our suffering comes from according to the yoga sutras our suffering comes from this idea is that that we think the physical world the newtonian world as he's calling it prakriti who we are in physical body is who we are really where who we are in physical body is just an expression, a creation of who we are really. You know, it's like if you look at an artist like Monet, you know, if you look at a Monet painting, the painting is an expression from Monet, but it's not Monet, right? The person, right? The spirit. So that's why we get have a hard time with this because that's our own attachment to ego. Ego is based in the physical world. So if we look at what the ego means, the ego is the false sense of, re of identity. The ego is not who we really are. It's our illusion of who we are. So this gets really, really deep, but it is absolutely deeply found this practice in the practice of yoga. All right. There is another reality, however, just as real as this one. It's the reality of the quantum world. And although you are not aware of the zillions of neurotransmitters leaping across space to create your experience of thought at this moment, it is happening nonetheless. And this reality is not Newtonian, it's quantum, with all its attendant, unpredictable ability and paradox. Also explains things like telepathy. I experience extreme telepathy with certain people. Um, I can feel when people think about me. I can feel when certain people are looking at my social media that I'm highly connected to, especially people that I haven't spoken to in a long time that I know I'm still highly connected to in the quantum. I can feel it when that Per person looks at my social media or one of my videos, I can actually feel it when that person is upset. I feel that, right? That's the quantum reality because in, in, qu in the quantum, we're all intertangled anyway, right? It's just the physical world where we have this idea of separation. Okay. The closest most of us come to an experience like the quantum world is when we dream. Things have a weird logic here. In the T Newtonian world, the alarm clock you set on your bed stand will stay there the whole night. It will not budge. A captive gravity and inertia. Unless someone or something knocks it off, it isn't going to move. But in your dreams, the clock could very well float in the air. And its hands might move backwards, propelling you into the past. Or the hands might move forward and rocket you into some distant version of your future. Our quantum-like dreams are not inhibited by the logic of the Newtonian world. These phantoms from the subconscious realms are, are anarchist when it comes to logic and predictability. Now, in the Western consensus view of reality, the Newtonian, that is, such things as dream experiences are viewed as imaginary and, and dismissed. What I wish to suggest to you is that not all of them are imaginary, certainly not any more imaginary than your current view of yourself absolutely your dreams hold a lot of important information i you know they tell you and this is true like you never have your cell phone in your dream like i never am texting in my dream i'm never like on facebook in my dream i'm never on youtube in my dream or twitter in my dream i i you can't even i can't even see a cell phone in my dream it's always with physical people but the other night i had a dream where someone texted me that i haven't heard from in a long time and it was weird because I never have my cell phone in my dream. So I don't know. We can't always dismiss our dreams. That might have been a vision of something to come, right? Because the cell phone was very, very much there in my dream and I saw the text. So anyway, and I was very happy to receive a that text. So anyway, okay. I suggest you think of some of these weird dreams like events as alternate perceptive realities, not more or less real than your Newtonian version of reality, just different. After all, scientist studies have demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt that you and I do not experience reality, whatever that is directly. Our perceptions of reality are filtered through the limitations of our physical senses, as well as our beliefs and expectations. Absolutely. So even in the real world of the Newtonian world, that is nothing but a, a shakti of the soul, we even know that everybody's sense of reality is very, very 
different. What is my daily reality is not your daily reality because really there is no such thing as reality. The quantum is what's reality. This also goes down to the understanding of karma. Again, all karma is is cause and effect. It's just your work. The fact that I got up this morning and opened this book and now I'm, is, is now the effect of me filming this book. That's karma. That's everything is a karma. It's a, it's a domino effect. But what somebody else may see as bad karma, I might actually see as good karma. You know what I'm saying? So it's all about your perception of reality. For example, the, everybody watching this channel knows the last five months of my life have been horrific. I have been physically assaulted almost on a daily basis through, uh, the, through the quantum by what is called black magic. I have bruised, bloody, you name it. And even though there especially was one night where I almost literally lost my life to this spell because they have put death spells on me. So kind of funny, kind of funny because I'm still here. Um, throughout this whole experience of what would be considered bad actually has ended up being really good. And even though I don't ever want to go through this ever again, as long as I live, in hindsight, I'm super grateful because I learned so much about myself. And I learned an, a deeper layer as to what's going on right now, especially in the quantum world. And I got stronger through this. I, I think a few episodes ago, I was telling Stephanie, I, you know, for me, when I started this channel, I really just wanted it to be a place of storytelling. I wanted to bring back the art of storytelling through research. We were coming into this great awakening. I wanted to start peeling back some of these weird stories, this folklore to figure out what the truth was and doing it, doing it as and doing it in a storytelling manner so that we could all understand and talk together collectively to figure out what the hell is going on, right? That's why I started this channel. However, with that being said, my whole life, I have had a lot of spiritual abilities. Um, you guys know Magdalene, I, I hear, I'm uh, a, a clairvoyant, audio clairvoyant, um, so I hear uh, Magdalene specifically. My whole life, I see spirits sometimes, um, both good and bad. I see dead people sometimes. I've gone through times where if I'm in a haunted house or a haunted building, which is really common down here in the South, I can talk to the spirits that are there. Uh, ghosts don't scare me because I've grown up with them. But when I first started this channel, I kind of kept that to myself. Like I didn't really talk much about it. Um, I do have like precognitive visions. Like I see things before they happen sometimes. And I just kind of left it, you know, and with the whole black magic thing, the head of the coven that I know was the head of the coven who I thought was one of my friends. Um, I don't think she knew that I had these abilities because I didn't talk about him. You know, I didn't talk about him. And through this experience, um, and maybe I didn't talk about him because I didn't want to come across as being that way, like being like a psychic or something or whatever you want to call it. Maybe I just kind of wanted to be in the state of always learning. But through this experience, I have learned the strength of owning my abilities and being like, I see you because I have abilities too. Even though I never spoke about them, I have them too. And so now I'm being more confident in things that I say and, and knowing why I have those abilities. I understand myself more now. I know what my soul's name is. We spoke about that with David Zublick last Tuesday on the Dark Outpost a week ago. Our soul also has a name. I have this name in this life as I've had names in multiple lives, but my soul's name is actually Lyra. And I had that through a channeling session into the quantum. And the night that that I figured out, I learned my soul name, it was like chills went down my spine. I was like, oh my God, that's my soul's name. The next morning I woke up and I could not remember the name Bryce. I could, for like 30 minutes, I sat up and I was like, what is my name in this life? I kept thinking Lyra, Lyra, Lyra. That was not my name in this life though. It's why I had to go look at my driver's license to remember my name was Bryce. I know some people might think that's crazy, but it's just owning that, that we are not just these physical beings, that our souls also exist within the quantum. And that's really where our reality is, you know? And, and that's also brings me a lot of peace too, because we do have these cords of connection to multiple people, right? We have soulmates, we have high level soulmates. And for some of us, like myself, we have a twin, which is where our soul has split. And especially with the twin flame journey, I've learned that, that is a very, uh, very hard journey to go on. It's not something to be like super romanticized. It can cause a lot of pain and suffering when twins, uh, apparently when twins come together, it's magical, super magical and a immense amount of love, but they're also mirror reflections of each other. Not just not physically necessarily. You can be, have a twin who's a different race than you, but usually you have the same ear. 
Um, and sometimes you might have the same markings on your hands because you are the same soul that's decided to experience life in two different bodies. Um, but you know, a lot of people when they're on the twin flame journey, because I've been reading, researching a lot about it and other people's experiences, it can be very heartbreaking because when you are on the twin flame journey, when the union is about to happen, usually things, forces of nature come in and separate you again. Usually it's the darkness. It's things like black magic, you know, that come in and like really separate you. And it can be very, very emotionally hard to go through. But something I keep telling people, I'm like, even though we don't know specifically what the future has in store, we know the probability of what the future has in store. What brings me comfort is that knowing in the quantum field and the quantum field, you're already with your twin you're already with your twin. Even though you're physically not together in this life, you've always been with your twin. Always. It's the same with a lot of high level soulmates that you might be separated from right now. In the quantum, you're still together. Right? And so that's powerful to understand that quantum. And that's why a lot of times telepathy gets really strong between twins or between high level soulmates is because you're literally together in the quantum, right? So when we start to relax into that and we understand that being in our physical world isn't the only, that's actually the illusion where the quantum is reality, there's some, brings you some peace there. There's peace to that. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you can't mourn over the fact that you're not with your person um, in the physical realm. It doesn't, you're allowed to mourn that. You're allowed to be sad. You're allowed to miss that person. You know, there's, there are people I, I really miss, you know, but you, you can have simultaneously those feelings because when you miss someone, when you mourn over them, a lot of times that is because you care about them and you, you want what's best for them too. Right. So it's, it's not, that's not a bad thing in itself, but you can also rest in peace knowing that your soul is still with them in the quantum. I hope that makes sense in my explanation of what he's talking about here. Okay. All right. I suggest you think of, okay, I suggest you think of some of these weird dreamlike events as altered perceptive realities, not more or less than your Not Newtonian vision of reality, just different. After all, scientific studies have demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt that you and I do not experience reality, whatever that is direct memory reading the paragraph we read before, that's okay. Our perceptions of reality are filtered through the limitations of our physical senses as well as beliefs and expectations. You are, for instance, inverting the pages of this book inside your brain. Your retina actually receives the images of these pages upside down, but your brain creatively turns them right side up. Your brain also tends to perceive what it thinks should be there even when it isn't. And anyone who has tried to proofread a document knows what I am talking about. The brain tends to see what it expects to see. Absolutely. When I used to write a lot back in LA, I, you have to have an editor because you will miss your own typos or miss your own stuff because your brain knows what you tried to say. That's why an editor is super important. All right. A misplaced comma often slides past the attention of a copy editor just because the brain doesn't expect one to be there. All of this mumbo jumbo is just to point out that we are not directly experiencing reality. Our perception of it is being co-created by both our physical body and our mind. Dreams in this context are just a normal, another form of created perceptual reality. I do not, by the way, believe that all dreams are alternate realities uh, bearing significance, only some of them. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think some dreams are not visions. I think sometimes it is just our subconscious mind playing out something that it needed to play out. Um, also, especially like for instance, when I was diagnosed with CPTSD, which is complex post-traumatic stress disorder, at that point in my life, I was having constant nightmares and I are night terrors. And I thought that that was just something normal, but apparently it was a sign that my nerves were fried. Um, and so that was my dream state telling me that there was something wrong with my nerves. And so when I went into do EMDR therapy to try to calm it down, it really affected my dream space as well. This is why I'm a sleepwalker. I think I've talked about this on the channel. I used to get up in the middle of the night, and like run, I was like night terrors, you know, and I still have the propensity from time to time to sleepwalk. Hence why when I go to bed at night, I have to actually lock my bedroom door too, is so that I stay in the bedroom um, and not leave the apartment sleepwalking. So, um, so yes, I, I agree with him on that. Some are vision, some are not. We have to have discernment when it comes to that. Most dreams are just the brain unraveling stress and some quite frankly are the result of bad food combining at dinner. Yep, that too. But some dreams are deeply significant from a psychological standpoint and can even be pretentious. These, these types of dreams, I believe, are 
of a different order than the others. And anyone who has such a dream knows what I'm talking about. Indeed, in an actual practice of internal alchemy, the alchemist enters a state of mind that is quite dreamlike. This is, I believe, a result of a specific brain changes that are created through alchemical meditations. Many internal alchemy, alchem Many internal alchemical practices increase alpha or the theta wave activities in the neocortex. And the deeper states of theta are experienced very much like dream states. W these waking dreams allows the practitioner to enter worlds of experiences that are not possible in normal waking states. As I said earlier, the methods of internal alchemy can be viewed as a means to directly affect a certain aspect of the quantum universe. We will also find that manipulations of quantum reality through the actions of internal alchemy take place most effectively in dreamlike states of mind. And every alchemical tradition has developed its own method for generating dreamlike states of awareness. So we're going to stop it there for now. Again, this part seven might be done in this is part seven, eight, it might be done in multiple parts, because this is a lot of information to take in. And I do want to give people enough time to kind of digest it, especially since we're doing this with the Sophia code as well, that the next section will be released tomorrow. Anyway, I hope you guys are having a wonderful day. And I will talk to you soon.